the GBAs. You probably heard of them. They're game, they're boy, they're false advertising. On their own, Game Boy Advances were not advanced at all in terms of tech. Your Nintendo got you over there looking like a chump. But, huh? What's that? Nintendo has a solution. Oh, thank Christ! Hey champ, feeling like less of a man than your PSP friend over there? Yeah. Well, just strap a funny little cartridge in and BAM! Your Game Boy now has a real-time clock, motion controls, a camera, video playback, a goddamn fucking photometric light sensor. Your move, Apple. With all of these add-ons, the possibilities of what a Game Boy was capable of seemed almost endless. If you had the right cartridge. Like this thing. So back in the mid 2000s, portable tech was really popping off. Devices that could fit inside of your pocket could now hold thousands of songs and even play video. Things like the iPod or even PSP were becoming extremely popular in the mainstream for these kinds of multimedia features, especially the PSP. So why are they also known by the name PlayStation Pornable? Tom, shut the f up. Nintendo, who of course was already heavily invested in the portable device market, obviously wanted in on this trend. So did we get some new fancy Nintendo branded MP3 player? Or maybe a new Game Boy with media playback? I mean, we, we, we got a, a cartridge with a headphone check on it. Your move, Apple. This is the Play-An, a special little cartridge released in 2005 for the Game Boy Advance SP, Game Boy Micro, and Nintendo DS that transformed those systems into a full-blown media player. Now, notice I didn't mention the original GBA, and that's because while the Play-An technically works with the OG model, Nintendo specifically advised against it due to the increased power requirements of this cartridge. Guessing two double A's just couldn't keep up with 144p Shrek or something. But hey, at least the Game Boy Player works! This is incredible! The Play-In features an SD card for loading media and its own headphone jack, which allows you to not only use headphones on the SP and Micro without an adapter, but it also gives you much higher sound quality. Like I said, media is loaded onto the device using an SD card, but with this thing being old, I guess, it can be pretty tricky to find a card that'll actually work with it. It took me literally weeks to find one that was old enough to be read by this thing. On top of that, you also have to make sure the media you're throwing onto this thing is in the right format. Yeah, you can't just throw any old mp3 or video file onto it and expect it to work. They all need to be converted to a specific file format. So, Nintendo actually included a special version of Panasonic's Media Stage software so you could convert all your files into a crunchy ass play in supported format. Yeah, good luck getting that shit to work. Luckily, Nintendo provided some pretty in depth specifications on what formats were compatible, and while, yeah, by today's standards, they're pretty. yikes. On the GBA screen, they actually don't look that bad. Uh, sound though? Um. Thankfully, you got that included headphone jack on the cartridge, which completely bypasses the GBA's grody ass sound hardware and gives you a relatively high quality feed. Now, all you cultured folks out there might have already caught on to the fact that this thing shares its name with a character from Rhythm Heaven, and that's because look! There he is! The boy! Yeah, this is actually the origin of play Ann, the character, with this predating the original Rhythm Heaven by almost a full year. He basically acts as the mascot for the play Ann, and it's pretty charming. Instead of just basic menus and a cursor like you'd expect from something like this, you control play Ann to select what songs you want to play. Each step represents a song on your SD card, and folders are represented by these little doors you can go through. It's all super cute and makes this feel like more than just a basic media player for the Game Boy. You can even tap the A button along to the rhythm and make him dance. Where did my little man go? The last thing to mention is Nintendo actually released a few mini games for this thing, which you could download from their website. 
They're pretty simple and rudimentary. Some are even inspired by a few WarioWare microgames. But the way they're packaged is super interesting. They're actually just ASF video files that you load onto your SD card, and the games are encoded into the data of the video... somehow. It's super fascinating that they work like this, and I wish I was smart enough to understand how they were able to pull this off, but... Alas. Oh, man. There's even a minigame which showcases the credits for the play-in, and we could see this thing had a lot of WarioWare and Rhythm Heaven team members working on it, like Goro Abe or Ko Takeuchi, which shouldn't be too surprising since, you know. Only a few months later, Nintendo released the Play-in Micro, which was exclusive to their Japanese online store. This was an updated model that came out alongside the Game Boy Micro. It's more or less the same thing, except it supported video playback out of the box, the original required an update, but it lacked support for the minigames, and they replaced Play-In with Mario, so, yeah, f*** this thing. This version actually saw a release in Europe as the Nintendo MP3 player. It never came out in the US, though, which is a shame. I personally would have loved to have this thing. Dedicated MP3 players were still fairly expensive in 2005, but the Play-In offered an extremely cost-effective way to turn a device you probably already owned into a pretty capable media player. Yeah, it was far from the best, but it got the job done at a fraction of the cost while also sporting that iconic Nintendo charm. At least we got a taste of the play-in over here with the 3DS's sound application, though. But while we didn't get the play-in in the US, we did get... TV shows on the go! TV shows on the go! It's G -B -A Video! Game Boy Advance Video! Yeah, released around the same time as the play-in were the Game Boy Advance Video Cartridges. Originally availed in 2003 as GBA TV before getting a name change, these were published by Majesco Entertainment, with Act Imagine, who Nintendo would later purchase and rename to Nerd, being responsible for developing the actual compression algorithm, which enabled full motion video to fit on these tiny little cartridges. Each cart contained a few episodes of shows from Cartoon Network, Nickelodeon, and even a few full-length movies. While, yeah, they're pretty cool and novel, I mean, look at that. It's beautiful. I'm guessing these are the reason the plan never got localized in the US. I mean, the plan kind of made these things a bit redundant. Why buy a $20 cartridge with only two to four episodes on it when you could buy a $50 one and put whatever you want on it? So, you know, I'm guessing Nintendo of America didn't want to step on their own toes here by releasing two competing products. But even that doesn't make much sense, because Europe and Japan both got a version of GBA Video in addition to the Play-In. Japan's take on GBA Video was especially cool, with it utilizing these gachapon machines to download new episodes to the cartridges. So, honestly, I have no idea why we didn't get the plan over here. Which sucks. Compared to GBA Video, the plan is just by far the superior product. You can also technically get much higher quality video and sound out of it compared to GBA Video, since you get to choose how to encode everything you put onto it. But regardless, whether it was the Play-In, Nintendo MP3 player, or even GBA Video, all of these perfectly showcase how the Game Boy Advance really could be more than just another gaming handheld. Now, if we're going to argue the GBA is more advanced than you think, or whatever I decided to title the stupid video, there's one thing this little guy's gotta have if he wants any hope of competing in the dog-eat-dog -dog world that is modern tech. A camera. Cameras started out as being nowhere inexpensive and are now neither of those things. Cameras are now cheap and everywhere. Your phone, car, fridge, front door, my uncle's toilet. Basically, slapping a camera on a thing isn't cool or modern anymore. It's actually dumb and scary. 
but back in the early 2000s, it was cool and sexy. And the Game Boy was one of the first pieces of consumer tech to do it. So, you know, Game Boys are sexy. The Game Boy Camera, y'all probably know this thing. Released in 1998, this was an accessory for the original Game Boy and Game Boy Color that let you take crunchy ass black and white photos on your Game Boy and even print them out with the Game Boy printer. Now, yeah, I, I know what you're thinking. This video is about the GBA and not those systems, but the GBA has backwards compatibility, so it counts. Kinda. But did you know, in 2004, the GBA actually did get a camera of its own and it could do video calls. Oh, so there was the Nyko worm cam, but that thing was awful and I don't want to buy one, so... The first attempt to slap a camera on this thing was with the Game Eye. The Game Eye was first shown off at E3 2002 alongside a GameCube game called Stage Debut. These two things acted as kind of a spiritual successor to the original Game Boy Camera and Mario Artist. Basically, it was the same concept here. You take pictures of yourself or friends and put them in game and make them dance or go to school. Yeah, this shit got cancelled. Now, Nintendo would later use the ideas they had for stage debut in future projects like the Me Maker and Tomodachi Life. But the actual camera, the Game Eye, got left on the cutting room floor. Things were looking pretty bad for Team Give the GBA a Camera, you cowards. Well, that is until a Japanese company called Digital Act picked up the slack for Nintendo and released the Campo Advance. This was a camera you slotted into your GBA and allowed you to make video calls on a Fucking Game Boy Advance! This is the stupidest fucking thing I, I've ever seen. But I love it. I love it for basically the same reasons I love the Play-In. It takes a relatively cheap device that you probably already own and gives it the capabilities of a more expensive device since, yeah, dedicated video conferencing equipment was not cheap in 2004. But to be fair, neither was this thing, with it being priced at 19,000 yen, or about $200 back then. Now, this thing isn't good, but it's usable, I, I think. Anyone got a spare landline I could plug into? So according to this IGN article written around the time this thing was announced, the camera had a resolution of 110,000 pixels and had a frame rate of a whopping 5 frames per second. And after doing my own research, I can confirm that... Yeah, yeah, that checks out. In the box, you got the device itself, an old-fashioned landline cable, a generic headset, and a GBA charger, since this bad boy required its own power source to work. Now, I don't have a GBA Micro to test on, but I'm assuming this thing works on all models of the GBA. But surprisingly, it doesn't work on the DS, which is strange. I'm guessing the DS just doesn't know what to do with the weird power requirements of this thing? I don't know. The software is pretty basic. It's what you expect from a phone application of the era. You can call people, uh, create a contacts list, adjust the settings for the volume and speaker, it's all very basic stuff. But regardless of its simplicity, it's still insane that something like this even exists at all. FaceTime and the rise of mobile video calling was still a ways off. But back in 2004, the GBA had already beat them to the punch. So when you're looking through all these specialized Game Boy cartridges, the one you're bound to come across the most is without a doubt carts featuring a battery to power some kind of real-time clock. Things like Pokemon used it for certain evolutions and items. Harvest Moon used it to have time pass on your farm while you're away. And you even had stuff like Mary Kay Nashley Pocket Planner, which lets you bland things. Now, while, yeah, these aren't the most interesting on their own, what is interesting is when you pair that real-time clock with something else. This is Boktai. 
These cartridges not only feature a real-time clock, but also a solar sensor to detect ultraviolet light from the sun, which being from the Midwest means for six months out of the year, this game just isn't for me. So it should be no surprise that this concept came from the mind of Hideo Kojima, the undisputed king of unconventional game design. But I mean, come on, a game you have have to play in direct sunlight. Uh, there's no way this is gonna be fun. So I am very burnt now. This game is insane. I, I was honestly not expecting it to be this good. I thought it was just gonna be a write-off, some shovelware shit. But no, Bokai is without a doubt one of the most underrated and underappreciated RPGs of all time, hands down. The game takes place in this like post-apocalyptic world which is overrun by monsters and these immortal vampire guys. With humanity on the brink of extinction, a boy named Django suddenly appears with his cool sun gun which can harness the power of the sun to defeat the vampires and save humanity. The gameplay is like this mix of Metal Gear meets Zelda. You traverse an overworld and go through dungeons like Zelda. But there's a big focus on stealth, since just like Metal Gear, your resources are limited. Those resources being literal sunlight. So if you're able to play during a sunny day, you can charge your gun to take out enemies and solve puzzles. The more sunlight detected by the cartridge, the faster your gun charges. But if you play at night or on a cloudy day with no sun, then you won't be able to charge your weapon and you're forced to take a more stealthy approach to conserve the sunlight you have in reserve. The entire world is actually affected by sunlight. Like for example, if you play in the sun, there'll be less enemies around since sunlight kills them. You can also utilize the sun to illuminate dark rooms or have it shine through windows inside dungeons to damage enemies and bosses, which isn't an option in the dark. Basically, without sunlight, you're kind of playing on hard mode. It all just makes for an extremely dynamic gameplay experience where you're having to strategize and change your playstyle day to day depending on weather conditions. It's really engaging. It's also crazy how the GBA's biggest flaw actually makes it the perfect device for this type of game. What I mean by this is if you know anything about the GBA, especially the original model, then you'll know how its screen is, uh... You know, this thing's on right now, by the way. Yeah, no backlights, so good luck seeing that shit indoors. But playing outside, now we're talking. Before I started playing, I actually thought the glare from the sun would make Boktai straight up unplayable. But no. I guess I forgot how good the GBA screen actually looks outdoors. No, my camera isn't doing it justice here, but it's almost like the GBA was designed to be played in these exact conditions, which makes it the perfect device for a game like Boktai, which is all about playing in direct sunlight. So while Boktai remained relatively niche, it still apparently did well enough to get three sequels, with the third game only releasing in Japan and the fourth being localized as Lunar Nights and acting as sort of a reboot to the franchise in the West. However, with Lunar Nights being a DS game, it unfortunately doesn't have the solar sensor embedded in the cartridge. But if you want the true experience and own a previous Boktai game, you can actually insert one of those games into the GBA slot of the DS and play Lunar Nights with the solar sensor mechanic. So, you know, if you're playing Lunar Nights, don't forget to pick up that DLC. But yeah, overall, the Boktai series is just incredible. Despite the GBA being relatively archaic in terms of tech, Kojima and his team were still able to utilize the hardware to give us an entirely unique experience that's just not possible on any other kind of device. Before Joy-Con, before Kinect, VR, or even the Wii, the Game Boy was out there doing motion controls before any of those things, and it was the coolest shit ever. 
Now, yeah, there were technically earlier examples of motion controls, but the Game Boy was the first time these types of games actually felt substantial, you know? Most early examples of the technology just felt tacked on and pointless. Like, you were always left asking yourself, am I doing this? Also, back then, motion controls felt like a big boy technology. Like, this kind of stuff would only ever be possible on big home consoles and arcades for the good shit. But then, Kirby. Kirby Tilt and Tumble. Yeah, yeah, Game Boy Color game, I know, but backwards compatibility, baby. So this game started life as Monkey Tilt and Tumble before dropping the monkey in favor of Kirby. Everything here is controlled entirely with an accelerometer, which is built into the cartridge. You tilt your Game Boy to move Kirby and flick it upwards to jump. There's also some obstacles and levels which are affected by how you're tilting. Overall, it's a simple but extremely charming game that feels like it just wouldn't be the same without the tilt controls. Which I can't say the same for. So yeah, all these motion control Game Boy games are pretty well known, but this is probably the one that most people have never heard of. Koro Koro Puzzle Happy Panachu is a Japanese exclusive Game Boy Advance game developed by Nintendo and Mobile 21. Mobile 21 was formed in the late 90s by both Nintendo and Konami, and their main focus was Game Boy Advance development, mainly creating games which would utilize the mobile adapter GB, which, hey, quick side note, that was another cool futuristic thing the Game Boy line could do. Using this adapter, Game Boy Colors and GBAs could connect to the internet using mobile phones, which allowed for games to include DLC, online play, or even the ability to do online trades in the case of Pokemon. Now, Koro Koro Puzzle Happy Panachu is one of the few games Mobile 21 worked on that, as far as I'm aware, didn't use the mobile adapter GB. Instead, it was all about motion controls, and actually, it was the first GBA title to include them, and honestly, you didn't need to. This is one of those match three or more puzzle games. The gimmick here is you need to tilt your system to move these little panachus around to line them up. Tilting a little or a lot doesn't change anything, you can only tilt in four directions, and yeah, they could have just used the D-pad. It's not a bad puzzle game by any means, it's just not a good use of motion controls. Which, speaking of... I don't like this game. Now, I already talked about this one in a previous video, so I won't spend too much time on it, but the motion controls here are more frustrating than anything. I always feel like I'm fighting with them, like they just don't feel that responsive. It does have some cool ideas, but overall it unfortunately feels like a budget release with a gimmick strapped on to get your attention. Which is in complete contrast to... Oh yeah, that's the stuff. <laughs> WarioWare Twisted is the Game Boy Advance at its finest. Not only does it have that addicting pick-up-and-play nature that WarioWare is known for, but it also showcases how dynamic and actually advanced this little guy can be. So, surprise surprise, this is a WarioWare game controlled entirely by Twisting. However, unlike previous motion control GBA games, Twisted utilizes a gyroscope in its cartridge as opposed to an accelerometer. Now, these two sensors both allow you to control something using motion, but gyroscopes tend to be a lot more accurate. Think, uh, Wii Motion Plus versus a normal Wii Remote. It's the same exact thing going on here. Now, on paper, this game kinda sounds like it'd be pretty shallow. I, I mean, you're just rotating the GBA back and forth. It's not like you can come up with over 200 fucking micro games. Yeah, 223 micro games are here. Twisted actually held the record for most amount of micro games in a single WarioWare until Gold came out in 2018. And these are honestly some of the most creative micro games in the entire series. Gyroscopes were still a pretty new and novel thing for consumer tech in the early 2000s. Smartphones, for example, didn't start including gyroscopes until like 2010, 
but back in 2004, Nintendo was already utilizing the tech on the Game Boy Advance. This type of precision with motion controls just wasn't that common back then, and the developers definitely took full advantage of it. You'll clean dishes, do a roundhouse kick, shake someone's hand, or even play through an entire Mario level using just tilt controls. WarioWare Twisted just perfectly showcases the potential behind motion and gaming, and the creativity that can blossom from it. While, yeah, the series has technically shown off motion better in future entries, I feel Twisted is still more notable due to the time and restrictions it was released under. It came out well before the big motion control boom that the Wii spurred on, and it also had to work within the restrictions of a budget handheld device. WarioWare Twisted and, well, Honestly, everything we've looked at in this video proves that you don't need to be on the latest and greatest hardware to foster innovation and be considered advanced. You just need an idea, a little creativity, and a funny looking cartridge. And that's what makes the GBA so memorable. Its unique and archaic hardware seems to just breed innovation. I mean, I haven't even begun to scratch the surface of what this thing is capable of. Like all the rumble-supported games, backwards-compatible stuff, full 3D games, and the treasure trove of homebrew stuff. Like, someone is porting Mario 64 to this thing. All that's to say is the Game Boy Advance might just be the most versatile handheld device of all time. And when it comes down to it, it really is more advanced than 